word eradicate the the muslims of this country and uh, since then we have seen a shift we have seen a change in the political atmosphere that we have seen a different kind of uh, resistant movement against cnrc in the country the particularly the uh, unique factor was that the country witnessed various forms of intense protest against these divisive laws it was jointly organized by students and mainly uh, at the forefront were the muslim women of uh, different places uh, heralded by shaheen bagh and uh, jafarabad and many other places and after that we have also seen uh, a pogrom a state sponsored pogrom against the muslims of northeast delhi so uh, at this when it 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 uh, it is an year to all these events now we are going through a different time a difficult time of uh, a pandemic across the world and uh, we as students we as activists and uh, uh, citizens are not being able to do much although at this time we also uh, have to remember that uh, lakhs of farmers are protesting in delhi uh, uh, at the borders of delhi against the new farm laws that have been introduced so at this moment it is important that that we remember and uh, uh, we do not forget especially at a time uh, uh, in the post truth world where things have been pushed to the uh, uh, pushed to the back uh, the discourse around the minority communities the discourse around the resistance uh, is being pushed to the back it's important that we keep the revolutionary spirit we keep the revolutionary memories intact of the anti ca uprising it is that at, uh, at this outset that fraternity movement university of hyderabad have decided uh, to organize a lecture series on anti ca uprising uh, and uh, we are having it from january uh, 10th uh, that is today to uh, to january 31st uh, so uh, we have we have planned around uh, three to four lectures uh, which you will get notifications in the in, in the coming days so today uh, we have uh, two uh, eminent speakers with us and uh, i'll introduce them first so uh, we have ishita chakrabarti who is a legal researcher who has been involved for some time now in researching over state repression and excesses and the dissonance between international and domestic laws so she basically did her uh, uh, ba llb honors from hidayatullah national law university and she has been publishing in several reputable academic journals such as queen mary indiana university emory international law review virginia journal of international law etc and uh, 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 we have another speaker uh, tazin Jun uh, junaid who is a student of uh, aligarh muslim university who was as we know was at the forefront of anti ca uprising in aligarh and uh, Uh, in delhi also and she has been writing about the struggles of minorities in india with a specific focus on the anti ca movement and uh, uh, we have seen her articles about uh, about this movement so uh, in the in the coming days we'll have uh, different speakers like shirjil usmani uh, and professor irfan ahmed professor ziauddin tania sulega etc so uh, without much ado uh, i invite uh, ishita chakrabarti to deliver her talk thank you hi uh, am i audible yes yes you go ahead thank you so much uh, university collective um hyderabad university for having me over um so i will be limiting myself to the legal aspects of the events which have taken place because i believe that the zeen is of course the best person to discuss the social events which transpired and um, what followed and so on um so i will confine myself to cidd jurisprudence which is cruel in human degrading treatment and torture jurisprudence um the lack of this jurisprudence in india um i will also be talking about the nhrc observations and recommendations which followed um after the events which transpired in these two universities and um, yeah so um initially i'll be discussing why these supranational norms matter right because 
one of the um, arguments, one of the principal arguments that we have been hearing since um, these international norms have been uh, called into question, right? They have been termed as Eurocentric. We have been hearing arguments that there's too much of democracy in India and so on and so forth. So uh, where do these principles exactly stand? Now, um, if one were to look at the Supreme Court jurisprudence in the formative years, uh, and even during the periods 1970s, 1980s, and so forth, the Supreme Court has consistently held in several cases that um, international principles such as the ICCPR, the ICSCR, the Universal Declaration on Human Rights, all of these principles could actually build into the domestic laws, right? So um, despite the fact that India needs to ratify and then pass laws within the parliament for any real implementation of these acts, they have been used in several cases, like um, one of the major cases was Vishakha versus State of Rajasthan, where um, the court actually formulated guidelines and even went on to hold that these principles until and unless they do not conflict with any existing domestic uh, provisions, they can always be used for lending some amount of content to, um, to, um, you know, to any existing laws. They can be used for the purposes of uh, framing these guidelines. And that is exactly why we have um, the sexual harassment at workplace guidelines, which followed. Um, Secondly, coming now coming to the NHRC observations and recommendations which followed. Um, following the events which had taken place and after the Allahabad High Court had directed um, the NHRC to look into the matters which transpired at, the, uh, at uh, AMU and even at Jamia, the NHRC came up with uh, certain very problematic observations, right? So for instance, it went on to state that every university um, should have certain grievance redressal mechanisms. So there should be conciliation mechanisms where the university administration goes on to talk with students and uh, redresses any problems that they might have so that they do not take to protest. So this, for instance, is problematic because what it says is this, that students do not have the constitutional right to protest. Secondly, it goes on to state that compensation can be granted to the students provided they are given on humanitarian grounds. So it does not find the activities of these police officials, the riot control uh, personnel and paramilitary forces as problematic. Rather, it trivializes them, stating that whatever happened at the two universities was a result of a confrontation between uh, the forces and between students. Then it states that um, the investigative agencies should actually go on to find the real perpetrators of the, uh, of the events. And students were basically brainwashed into being led by these, um, by certain elements, right? It also states that there was lack of evidence in the matter. So it does not take into account the CCTV uh, footages, which uh, were present, for instance, in the library. Uh, it does not take into account the documentary evidences, which are widely available. It dismisses all of that. And finally, it goes on to state that certain disciplinary actions might be taken against the police officials. So it limits itself to suggesting, to recommending that the state can go on to take uh, disciplinary actions, maybe, against uh, the police forces, right? Um, first of all, with respect to uh, the constitutional right to protest, which it trivializes. Um, in several cases, it has been held that, uh, uh, for instance, the Himmat Lal Shah case itself, it goes on to state um, that, of course, the right to protest is subject to it being peaceful and it has to be balanced against societal needs and so on, right? But um, what has to be seen is whether prior to the use of force by the police, there is any such event which gives rise to an apprehension that violence or, uh, you know, a, a certain degree of force is going to be, uh, is, is, is going to be used by these protesters, right? 
so there has to be a reasonable apprehension of such violence taking place and it has to be imminent in nature um however if you see that these, these were merely students who were participating in democratic and peaceful protests right secondly um the uh, secondly there's also a lack of jurisprudence over how police forces are supposed to uh, you know enter into universities there's there's only one case which is the state of uh, the case of vijay kumar versus state of madras wherein it has been discussed that because these universities are centers of learning that's why it's customary for the police officials to actually take permission before entering these university spaces but then a lot of arguments following these events transpired where um, you know um, it was stated by several uh, mostly right wing media uh, and um, uh, it it was stated that the police has a right to enter into any territory for the purposes of effecting an arrest um, and it can use force uh, to effect such arrests as under section 46 of uh, the crtc and so on and so forth um apart from this the observations which were made were problematic because if you see the history of nhrc in several cases it has intervened and has actually stated you know for uh, for example in the naroda patia case what it did was it it brought about a writ petition uh, before the supreme court holding that the investigations should be transferred uh, from the state police agencies to uh, the cbi and so on it stated that certain material for certain material which are being extracted there has to be a forensic evaluation done and and and, and so on right but in this case you see that the cctv footages which were available which were widely available they were not taken into account uh, no forensic analysis was done of them so the nhrc basically has relegated its position um and uh, for reasons known best to it um when it comes to cidd jurisprudence first of all i'd like to highlight why the torture and cruel inhuman degrading treatment jurisprudence is important it goes on to uh, so what torture actually says is that it's a principle of just cogens right which basically means that there cannot be any form of derogation from torture so even if uh, for instance you are not a state party to the un convention against uh, torture the un cat you still have to abide by the principles and no state official can actually participate in the commission of torture um apart from this what torture does is state that any state official who takes part in committing such acts of torture can be subjected to uh, a universal jurisdiction which basically means that any other uh, uh, he might be subject to prosecution before any other court uh, anywhere in the world the torture jurisprudence also states that a person who is involved in torture will not only be individually liable but also his superiors will be liable for not taking any action where they knew of uh, uh, they knew of the likelihood of such torture taking place and in case they do not take any reparative measures that is in case they do not follow with uh, disciplinary measures or uh, uh, or institution of uh, institution of prosecution and other proceedings then they would uh, uh, then these superior officials will also be held as liable it also states that no immunities or amnesties can be available to such person who commit torture now in india we have section 197 of the crpc which basically states that before any kind of prosecution goes on uh, is is commenced against any official of the state any public servant prior sanction has to be taken uh, from uh, from the concerned superiors right but under the torture jurisprudence if you classify an act as an act of torture these immunities these amnesties are not available to you so for instance uh you also have a statutory period within which proceedings can be brought in right but classifying an act as an act of torture would basically eliminate this period um it also states that reparative measures 
cannot be limited to simple disciplinary actions there has to be prosecutions there has to be criminal proceedings initiated against such individuals now what we have in india currently is this we have section 330 and section 331 of the indian penal code which basically states that um you know you, uh, police officials or any public servants cannot use force for the purposes of extracting any information or confession and if they do so then they will be liable for maybe a maximum penalty of um a maximum uh, period of imprisonment of maybe 7 years right um even if you see the prakash singh judgment in uh, where it spoke about the institution of police complaints authority and so on what it stated was this that the police complaints authority will be liable for um uh, to look into any aspects of police excesses or misconducts and so on right so it classifies all these actions wherein the police uh, goes on to inflict excessive use of force it classifies these action merely as misconduct or um you know um police excesses right um torture naming an act as an act of torture also has certain advocacy benefits so just like how uh, there exists a difference between genocide and crime against humanity when you know when you classify an act as a crime against humanity even though crime against humanity of murder could be comparable to that of a genocide still labeling an act as an act of genocide as compared to a uh, crime against humanity has the advantage has a political advantage to it right so um similarly classifying an act as an act of torture has certain advocacy benefits to it um now in india uh, when you come to india the jurisprudence on ill treatment and torture is mostly confined to article 21 of the article 21 of the constitution right to life um however uh internationally speaking we have four major principles which are also embodied in certain uh conventions and declarations uh, like the basic principles on the use of force and firearms by law enforcement officials so these four principles talk about the principle of necessity the principle of distinction the principle of proportionality and precaution right um out of all of these principles uh the principle of proportionality for example has been limited to certain executive actions like you have the anuradha basan judgment case or maybe the ram leela maidan judgment which basically states um it's it's also used as a principle in uh, the principle of of self defense where it is said that you can inflict only so much of force that is necessary for uh, uh, for um uh, you know for meeting uh the imminent force right but there is very less jurisprudence when it comes to these other principles of distinction and precaution and necessity now in 2017 following certain events um the un human rights committee had actually uh sat down to discuss uh principles of cidd that is ill treatment cruel and inhuman degrading treatment and torture outside custodial settings so what we currently have in india um are cases like d k basu and uh, prem shankar shukla uh, francis corali so all of these cases limit the use limit any infliction of ill treatment and uh, any form of remedy to a custodial setting right uh, to maybe methods of interrogation and so on but outside of these custodial settings there is no such jurisprudence so indian law does not really deal it it does not really look into cases where excessive use of force is inflicted against um against individuals for example maybe you know uh, in the context of a peaceful protest right as in as in this case so it does not look into these situations now the un special rapporteur on torture and the un human rights Com- committee basically it went on to state that this was very important because most of um because uh, what is currently taking place in the global scenario is this 
that most of the use of force is now being shifted from a custodial setting to a non custodial setting right so even before a person is actually being taken into custody or being taken into detention um uh, force excessive use of force is being meted out against such people and usually the argument is that the the law the argument which is used by the law enforcement officials is that uh um, maybe there were some anti social elements who were present within the crowd and that is why they had to take such actions or uh, you know um just for the maintenance of law and order um they had to take these actions and so on and so forth um but what it would state is this firstly the principle of necessity would state that you can use force only when there is an imminent threat to you right secondly the use of force has to be limited to the amount which is necessary so for example if students had started retreating from the place you cannot um, enter into the campus and then inflict force upon them thirdly there is the principle of distinction which states that force has to be inflicted only upon those individuals who are uh, taking part in such violence we have uh, you know this huge amount of documentary evidence where where uh, we have these videos um of police officials entering into the library into the mosques and all these places and then inflicting force on individuals so these students had not even participated they had they were not even present at the protest but the, but then they were met with such excessive use of force and finally there is the principle of precaution which basically states that and yeah so the principle of precaution is actually one of the least discussed principles within the indian jurisprudence and what it states is this that even less lethal modes of weaponry should be uh, should be used very carefully right so uh, there's this classic argument which is used um by the law enforcement agencies or by the government that uh you know certain individuals had taken to stone pelting and that is why it was important for us to use rubber bullets or uh, you know even resort to light ammunition right so what the un has said is this that no weaponry can be said to be uh, a non lethal mode of weaponry right so for example rubber bullets when um, shot towards the eyes or maybe uh, you have these elect uh, electric devices right you have taser weapons so these weapons can be used in a manner which can make it lethal so even if they do not result in some kind of grievous injury or uh, in in some kind of permanent damage they can always result in grievous injuries so they must be inflicted taking into account the setting um for example in closed confined spaces uh like inside the library for instance um once you start using tear gas or maybe rubber bullets and uh you know light ammunition that crosses all these principles that breaches all of these principles um uh, now um, whether or not these acts amounted to torture or cruel human degrading treatment can also be assessed with you know the the uh, the kind of force which was used uh the setting within which it was used right so if you see here like i mentioned there was indiscriminate use of force there was use of force against individuals who were um completely unarmed right uh they were peaceful demonstrators and then these um uh police personnel or right control officials they actually entered into all of these confined spaces they entered into mosques and the library and washrooms and all of these spaces and then they started targeting the individuals right which clearly shows the intention to uh, to not merely curb a law and order situation uh, uh, the breach of a law and order situation but also to inflict punishment upon these individuals for uh, for uh, the action of you know undertaking a peaceful protest itself right so the un has stated that all of these incidences could actually lead to an inference that the excessive use of force was not just you know it it was not just a miscalculated use of force but it actually amounted
to CIDD treatment or torture. Similarly, there have been accounts of um, at least three students from uh, AMU uh, who were taken into custody. They were uh, beaten and they were not allowed to contact their uh, lawyers or their representatives. You know, they were not allowed to talk to their relatives um, and uh, they were kept overnight. So all of these incidences, again, show that there was a, a CIDD treatment or torture meted out to these, uh, to these people. Um, apart from this, you also have, for the purpose of inferring any, um, uh, you know, um, ill treatment which is meted out to them, you have, um, you can usually do that for instance, by looking at what kind of post facto measures are taken, right? That is, after the incident has occurred, what was the reaction of the state? Did it undertake any prosecutions? Um, did it uh, even go on to file any FIRs uh, or anything of that sort? Um, what you see here is that the state missionary was actually uh, used for the purpose of charging the very individuals uh, who were uh, the victims, right? So all of this kind of shows the ill treatment uh, and torture which was meted out against uh, the students. Um, uh, apart from this, uh, there uh, uh, what is uh, what the uh, uh, a recent report which was there um, brought about by a collective of academicians and lawyers and activists, um, citizens against hate. They brought out a report called the dismantling of minority education, right? So this report went on to collect the testimonies of over 200 uh, students who were present on the campus. Um, it also looked into assertions of sexual violence and psychological uh, impact upon the students and so on. And um, uh, it, it, it came to similar conclusions that, you know, uh, the events which transpired even if they were not torture, they could at least rise to the level of cruel and human degrading treatment. Now, the report makes certain recommendations. For example, it states that uh, there should be the institution of a commission of, in, uh, of a commission of inquiry, which looks into these matters, because of course, the individuals who have themselves been accused of perpetrating the violence, they cannot really be the ones undertaking such an investigation. Um, um, it has also been proposed that, uh, again, it has been proposed that India should maybe uh, ratify the UN GATT. And interestingly enough, uh, there have been uh, attempts in the past, there have been attempts twice uh, in the year 2010, and as far as I can collect, uh, recollect um, in 2017, where uh, there were attempts to bring in a torture bill, but then um, this lapsed. Uh, before the Lok Sabha. Um, so maybe there could be similar efforts taken towards this. And uh, yeah, so these are the recommendations which have been made before it. And I think um, uh, the, the, the reason why this discussion is important is because um, any lack of CIDD uh, uh, jurisprudence or torture jurisprudence in India exposes how we look at police violence um, as something which is normal, something which is miscalculated use of force, merely. Uh, thank you, Shita, for your uh, insightful uh, lecture. And um, yeah, it, it is it is kind of a normalized thing that police force is uh, like they can get into anywhere at, at whatever time and whatever condition on anybody who is um, who might be a woman or might be a, a indifference of gender so uh, th th this uh, this lecture was very insightful in that sense that how the legal perspective is um, is looking into uh, such a matter and thank you Ishita. thank you very well and um, I'll uh, just move on to uh, the zine first, and then we'll have the Q and A session in the in the end. I'll uh, invite uh, the zine, the zine, 
Yeah. She, she has already been uh, introduced. Uh, so, uh, yeah, hand over to Sazeen. Thank you so much. Uh, first of all, I would like to thank you. Uh, am I audible? Yeah, yeah, yeah. You are audible. Okay, thank you. So, good evening, everyone. Assalamu alaikum. Thank you so much, University uh, Fraternity Movement of University of Hyderabad, for inviting me. Incredibly honored. And as everyone knows, my topic of the lecture is at clause four uh, assertive identities and deceptive solidarities. As most of the people who are involved in the movement uh, know, that this protest uh, is it's about uh, us asserting our identity and uh, have, having to face deceptive solidarities from leftist, leftist liberals. Um, I'm so sorry, there's some type of interference in the audio. Uh, it's, it's clear. I think some mic is open. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So as we know, when the uh, movement against CEA started, it had two focal points, one in AMU and one in Jamia. And when the protests were happening, they were a different type of protest. Independent India hadn't seen Muslim protesting like, like this. You know, the protests were more about our identity, were more about our dignity than about the CEA. CEA was there, of course, CEA and RC, that was, you know, as the pol as political analyst term it, it was the tri triggering cause or the triggering uh, point at the culmination point at which, because of which we were protesting. But, but the protests were not only because of CEA, or were not only because were not only there to you know to secure our rights as Indian citizens. As Shradil Imam said, ये सिर्फ सीए की कहानी नहीं है, ये कहानी एक लंबे बिट्रेल की है. कोई बोलता है छः महीने, कोई बोलता है छः साल, कोई बोलता है सात साल. So जो प्रोटेस्ट हम लोग कर रहे थे, it was about asserting our identity as legitimate as legitimate citizens in India. It was about securing our dignity, which has been you know vilified. During Ram Monday, during Triple Talaq, during you know the recent Love Jihad, bill. it was all about that. It was about this Islamophobia which we were seeing in Indian state and you know in all the Indian state institutions and how they were continuously targeting Muslims. And this was not only during the time of BJP. Even before BJP, if we look back at Congress, we would see you know certain acts, certain Islamophobic acts targeting specifically Muslims. So when we were protesting, it was not only about CA. CA was the triggering point. But you know, up koi bhi speech utha ke dekhne, imam ki ya rena ki ya lagida ki. Or you see the uh, general narrative which has been revolving around CA protests in EMU and Jamia before 15 December. It was ke hum log apni dignity ki lagai hai hai. Hame dignity jo humari ek chun li gai hai. You know, second, we have been uh, delegated to second class citizens. We have to get, get it back. We, we do not just want a license to live in India. We need the right to, to live in, in India as um, with as much dignity as other Indians do. So the protests were about that. And as we were protesting, uh, we saw uh, 15 December happen. 15 December happened in India and Jamia. We were virtually assaulted. Our campuses were invaded. Our voices, our voices were muffled. We were physically assaulted. We were verbally assaulted. You know, a lot of us were arrested. And there was this whole vilification going on. So we were seeing, uh, we were seeing all of this was happening, and after, and till 15 December, you would see that you know at the protests in AMU and Jamia, Delhi, Okla, and Aligarh, you would see that only a certain group of people were protesting. Everyone was not protesting, and among this everyone, the most prominent group which you would find was the was that of the leftists and liberals. They were not uh, protesting with us because they thought that even though they believed that CEA was, you know, it is against, they did not want to protest because they believed uh, that um, our stages were very Islamic. They believed that we were the way we were protesting. We were protesting as fundamental, as fundamentalists. That we were uh, our protests, our speeches, our speeches were very Islamic, and we were sort of trying to show communalization, and that's why they were not protesting with us. And it was fine because if they couldn't protest with us on our on because of five then to protest with us, we did not need their solidarity. So this was happening before 15 December. But as 15 December happened, suddenly you know the anti-CA movement went on went global, and this is when the appropriation started. You know, this is when the leftist liberals they try, they started coming to us and they were like, we also want to protest with you. And this is how you see the appropriation of the movement, which was, you know, the movement started 
to secure dignity of muslims the movement which was started it became a movement to save the constitution of india and so uh, there is a look at how you know the appropriation started so first of all we were told that uh, you know that he is not only an attack on muslim it's an uh, it's an attack on secularism it's an attack on the constitution hame bar bar ye kaha ja raha tha you know i recall when i was in aeu mein thi main it was maybe 12 or 13 december and yogendra yadav was there and uh, we were and we had to break the hostel gates and come to come join the protest so we were there and you came the other was like yeah he gave me the mic he was like can you please give us speech so i gave the speech and i mentioned briefly that ca was in direct attack on muslim and this is why we have to protest as muslim and after my speech he sort of like condemned me moderately he was trying to condemn me that uh, you know uh, you know this this attack is not only on muslim it is also an attack on dalits and bahujans and it, it and it is specifically an attack on the secular fabric of, of constitution etc etc so this type of thing it was not only happening in aeu or only yogendra yadav was not doing it you know this was only happening because of the leftist liberal student organizations who were continuously pandering to this narrative that ca is not only an attack on muslims it's an attack on the constitution and you know only muslims are not the uh, victims here as dalits also there are bahujans also so why only muslims should lead the protest so there was this why only which was continuously thrown at us after 15 december and this was and i would again remind this was when they wanted to come to protest and this was because we were getting the global media coverage and you know we had the stage and we had the mic and they wanted the stage and mic and they came and they tried to they did not even try they were very successful let it they appropriated the whole movement according to them we were again told that when we were protesting as muslims you know we were continuously asserting our identity by slogans or by singing hum dekhenge we were excluding non muslims there was this alienation that the non muslims were feeling we were making our leftist liberal allies fearful by asserting our identity and all of this you know would assert will make our movement weaker will will we will weaken our movement because we were making our allies alienated and as such the movement will fail so this fear was you know this fear was braided in all uh, in all muslim protests and after 15 december you would see a sudden sharp contrast between the protests which were happening before 15 december and after 15 december you would see in okla you know suddenly um, after 15 december you know before 15 and 13 december ek bar namaz hui thi wahan pe it was a friday and a whole namaz was done in amu also the protests were more about you know we were continuously talking about muslim dignity and after 15 december you saw a very sharp contrast there was a suddenly you know tiranga constitution and everything of course we were also talking about that before 15 december but there was a sudden you know there was a sharp portraying which was happening after 15 december and that's how the movement was appropriated i remember i was in jamia and i was uh, the i came i went there after shashi tharoor had already been there and my whole speech was about why we should you know we should speak about why should we should chant la ilaha illallah when while we were protesting and after my speech uh, one of my friends told me that you know the organizers who were behind you they were they were again calling continuously they were uh, discussing among themselves ke mic band kar dena chahiye why is she talking about la ilaha illallah she should talk about ki why she is again and again mentioning muslim so this is the type of thing which was happening and most of the people who were discussing that were leftist liberals or only leftist liberals leftist and liberals so this type of fear was thrown and after my speech in jamia one of the organizers who actually believed in identity assertion also told me that you know even though i believe in identity assertion as much as you do this will actually weaken the movement so maybe you know this is not the correct time to to assert our identity or to fight islamophobia we should be fighting to save our citizenship but my point is that there is no correct time to resist islamophobia there is no correct time to say that i am a muslim and i have as much as right as a hindu to live in india and live here with as much as with as much dignity as they do there is no correct time for that there, there is no every point every time is correct for saying something like this if i am being attacked because of my religious identity i have to assert it otherwise you know me getting a license to live in india doesn't matter because in essentially my citizenship won't be equal to uh, to their citizenship 
and that is what our fight was against so we saw during this all of these points the points of exclusion and elimination and that muslims are here to save the constitution etc etc and the whole movement which started to you know to save the dignity of muslims it it suddenly transformed into changing a movement to save the indian constitution and then i have and then now i would like to come by indian by you know why the muslim protesters were locating themselves in identity politics why they were asserting their identity even you know we also need to understand why it was happening it was happening because we were being attacked or because of our religious identity and this was not happening it's only because of see as again I, as previously i mentioned see was only the culmination point so even before you know before the ca we were seeing a certain type of attacks the lynching which were happening you know the abrogation of article 370a and after you know there was this round of lynching of kashmiris and before that there was a continuous lynching of muslims and the ram mandir debate you know the ram mandir judgment had already came in and triple talaq had already been passed so all of these were concerted attacks on muslim or these were not only you know they were not only an attack on our citizenship or on our existence they were an attack on us because of our religious identity if i hadn't been a muslim i wouldn't have been i i wouldn't have felt as much vulnerable as i am being now and that is what the majority needs to understand so the second thing which the majority needs to understand that the way a leftist liberal allies need to understand is about why 15 december happened 15 december did not happen because i was protesting in amu against ca no it was it was it happened because i was protesting as a muslim against ca in a muslim campus if the same protest had been had been you know it had been taking place by non muslim and in a non muslim campus such as jnu or du such an attack would have never happened here we have to understand the vulnerability which comes with being a minority especially being a muslim in india and understanding the privilege with which you know with the non, with our non muslim allies have of protesting in non muslim spaces and not being attacked so there is this vulnerability which we have which we have to deal with again and again and there is this privilege they have and they are and the majority the leftist liberals they do not want to acknowledge that privilege they again and again they try to you know they are they are again in the underscoring that we were being extremists that we were we shouldn't have raised the slogan etc etc then there is this other thing you know the state feels that it has the authority to kill muslims to butcher muslims to you know to rob muslims to do whatever they want and not to be and not be accountable to anyone and this is also happening because our leftist liberal allies have been silent about it you know the lynch, uh, the whole narrative the, around lynching have been about you know the right to live and the right to freedom of uh, religion at, at no point islamophobia came in islamophobia has did not come in in you know in the uh, main course of uh, political political narratives unless we started speaking about it so this is the type of solidarity which we have been receiving from uh, leftist liberals since the day they came in now the other thing which was uh, happening which we need to understand is that the onus of explaining all of this the onus of the onus of explaining why the lynchings were happening why triple talaq was passed was why 370 was abrogated you know why ram mandir judgment happened all of this you know the onus of explaining all of this does not lie with us it lies with the majority just like the onus of saving the democracy does not lie with the minority it lies with the majority and we need to understand that after 15 december we there has been there has been you know this continuous process all of us we had been trying to explain you know we have been trying to explain why we were asserting our identity why asserting our identity is important why our leftist liberals allies need to support it why do we need unconditional support uh, unconditional solidarity we have been writing about it we have been reading about it we have been doing you know discussions about it and we have been holding con- conversations but we have to understand that at no point that is you know the majority is not understanding it still there there is still this thing that uh, okay fine but you know um okay fine you know i support imam's right to uh, freedom of expression but he was talking about cutting off his arm so this is the type of thing which was happening you know that okay i you know i support pathan he should not be in jail but you have to understand that he had you know that he was armed 
this was this is the type of narrative which we which we, which we are currently facing given after such a long period of trying to explain you know it's it has always it has almost been an year and we have been doing this for a year we have been trying to explain you know why we need to assert our identity identity to fight islamophobia and the majority the leftist liberal our allies they just don't they just don't want to understand why this is happening and uh, so where does that leave us it leaves us you know as the at the first two words of this lecture and it is at the crossroads so we are at a crossroads now it's about identities and solidarities as we all know we are a minority we need solidarities to fight you know with our, if we don't have the solidarity then um, then we will just we will fail and so we need solidarity okay but if we assert our identity the only solidarity we will need we will receive is is a deceptive solidarity we will receive it but we, but it will not be unconditional it will be conditional it will come with the terms it will they will say okay you can do this but don't say la ilaha illallah so this is type of solidarity we will need we will receive they will be there at our stage they will give their seats but when the states starts incarceration they will only incarcerate muslim prisoners they will only incarcerate muslim uh, protesters so this is the solidarity we will need if we assert our identity and then try to get solidarity if we do not assert our identity and here is the interesting thing if we still if we do not assert our identity we will still receive the same solidarity we will not receive unconditional solidarity and this is because in the end our identity does not lies with us not asserting it or not asserting it it lies with the fact that i am a muslim so if my name is tazim janat it is tazim janat it is a muslim name no matter what i do no matter if i wear a hijab or not in the end if my name has a muslim has muslimness in it it's even a muslim a little bit so the deceptive solidarity is coming at that point because you know the liberals the leftist and liberals they only see political muslims as illiberal and they think it is a favor you know when they are giving us giving us solidarity they think they are you know uh, distributing favors they think that uh, we are we know we are superior than you and we are going to teach you how to protest because you don't know how to protest you will become fundamental and even this cross road has been made has been romanticized by a lot of people of our movement and and of leftist liberals and it is like the share has been thrown a lot ke ek tarz e tagaffal hai to wo unko mubarak ek arz e tamanna hai to hum karte rahenge ke is liye theek hai aapko ye tagaffal hai aapko ye shikwa hai ki hum apni identity assert kar rahe hain lekin phir bhi hum tamanna kar rahe hain ki aap jo hain aa jaiye hum apni identity halka sa hide hal halka sa side mein rakh dete hain the point is you have to understand no point no matter if you you know if you put your identity or not no matter what you do the solidarity when you will receive is the same uh, for example seen shajil imam or he sharuk put sharuk pathan both of those who have been very assertive about their identity they are there and i know a lot of people who were not very assertive about their identity during the protest and they are also there so there is no difference of solidarity which is both of them receive in the end the solidarity of the leftist liberals with us it was laid on the basis of how that still you know what matter no matter what their political location was they are muslim no matter that ishra jahan was congress or was belong is a congress member she is a muslim so the solidarity becomes deceptive and so no matter what we do at at this crossroads no matter at what at which direction we choose you know of asserting our identity or not asserting our identity we will receive the same level of deceptive solidarity as others uh, it won't it is not going to change and at this point we should also be demanding the sort of solidarity that we deserve which is a real solidarity we need a solidarity not only to you know not only as a um, we do not need a conditional solidarity we don't need a solidarity with which you're convenient to get you know which comes with terms and conditions of us not you know uh taking a certain slogan or us not supporting imam or us not supporting pathan we do not need a solidarity like that we need an unconditional solidarity because at this point muslims in india are facing a genocidal project and again the onus of understanding this lies with the majority and not with us we in the end have only one choice and that is to assert our identity and continue facing this movement it is going to be a 
big fight but we cannot afford to set go to identity only to get solidarity which in the end will betray us thank you so much uh thank you tazeen uh, for this uh, very beautiful lecture and uh, yeah of course uh, the, the 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 question of uh, whether to assert the identity and then ask for the solidarity or wait for the solidarity or not to um, assert the identity and wait for the solidarity that's 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 actually a crossroad where uh many of the discussions are stuck at and uh, many of the time m- much of the time we are trying to explain it as uh, you were uh, you were rightly saying rightly explaining about that and um yeah th- there is no right time for the fight against each of these like whether you have to fight for anti uh, uh, fight against ca you have to fight differently than um take the islamophobia issue then you have to fight differently and the dalit issue then you have to fight differently there is no uh, right time for each of the days so it is always a pack of the fight we are always fighting and uh, there is uh, nothing we can put away from the uh, f- from the uh, domain and wait for the uh, solidarity yeah very very much thank you um tazeen and uh, yeah i i'd like to uh, invite everyone to uh, have the um discussion so the floor is open now and, um for any any questions uh, you can raise the hand and i'll unmute you or you can unmute yourself okay uh, let me start with a question i have uh, uh, two actually uh, one is towards uh, ishita uh, ishita is there right you online yeah okay okay sure so uh, i uh, i just needed a clarification regarding uh, the torture bill which we were talking about um, yeah. like what is the um, you know what is the development in that that uh, area is there is there something which we have which have been done or is it still no. so uh, the torture bill was introduced twice in 2010 and in 2017 but post that it actually lapsed and after that there has been uh, no follow ups over it and of course india keeps on saying that you know it, it's not going to ratify it uh there have been uh, we do have these um soft treaty mechanisms right we have monitoring bodies and so on which um, the un treaty bodies have been consistently asking uh, india to actually ratify it because then it would become obligatory for india to actually uh, bring about such a legislation but then um no progress has been made in that field as yet so all we have right now currently is just article 21 jurisprudence that's it okay sure thank you anybody else with some questions oh okay okay here is a question in the in the uh, chat box it's um, towards tazeen tazeen can you see the question i'll read it once for you so uh, how do you explain the idea of identity assertion and secularism both going together or differently yeah 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 i understand that uh that's a very good question and we need to yeah we need to understand it because if you know again and again we have thrown that identity assertion and secularism they do not go hand in hand and this was 
this happened when Tharoor was also, you know, he started the whole debate and everyone was saying this, the identity decision and, and the right to protest and whatever, whatever. They were not, it cannot all, all be done together. Uh, so the question is, so identity assertion and secularism, if we see both of them simultaneously, we need to understand what secularism means. Secularism means that, essentially, it means that state, you know, the, the state apparatus this should not have any sort of religion inherent in it, and that's what secularism means. And identity assertion, as we were doing in, uh, as we were doing in, during the protest. And if uh, they are both together, if they are existing, both of both of they are uh, existing together. At no point does our asserting our identity has any problem with secularism. Secularism, because uh, all of you know, all religions should be allowed, sh should be allowed, no, not allowed, because all of the, all of the uh, religions should exist peacefully together. You know, they should have cohibit. They sh they should be able to cohibit. And that's what we were seeing. So they they can exist. Both of the both of them do exist together. Yeah. So yeah, that's that's it. Uh, there's another question I received. I received it from from a junior. Um, yeah, should I be, should I answer that? Yeah. Sure. 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 What would you ideally? Okay. What would you ideally expect of your leftist allies? So why, what do I ideally expect of our, of our leftist allies is to pass the mic to us, you know. They have been speaking for the past a lot of decades and, they, and everyone has been listening to them. Now they should use that position, pass the mic to us, legitimize our voices and listen to what we are saying. They, you know, at the points when we point out to them that this is, this is where you are going wrong. You know, love jihad is not only about the right to love. It's also, it's also about Muslim men being criminalized. They should, they should. Add, if if they cannot understand it, they should ask the question. They should start the process of unlearning and lean on relearning the concepts which they have. And when they are coming to give us the solidarity, the solidarity should not come with any terms and conditions. It should be unconditional, no matter what we do or how we try to, you know, or what we are doing. It should come with the confidence in us. And it should come with the confidence that uh, we are protesting rightfully. They, they should be. They should not be placing themselves superior to us or looking at us as inferior protesters or someone who needs to be taught. Which is what happens uh, every time where whenever there is a protest happening and the leftists or liberals are there. Yeah. Okay. So there is another question which is. Uh... Uh, yeah. Yeah, about Islamophobia law, Islamophobic law, yeah, anti Islam. Um, so, as far as I know, there are currently discussions going on over, um, you know, the bringing in of such um, discourse, anti Islamophobic discourse. Um, currently, however, because of academic reasons, though, it's, um, it's halted because um, you know, uh, there was this UK committee initially, which was discussing how do you define Islamophobia in the first instance? As in, should it be something uh, similar to how uh, anti-racism provisions exist uh, abroad? Or, um, you know, how, how should it be exactly formulated, right? Um, I personally believe, however, that, uh, you know, we already have provisions such as Article 14 of the Constitution, right? Which, like, you know, if you look at it that way, the Article 14 within the Constitution is like a grand norm, right? Um, I'm, I'm not really very sure how uh, the anti-Islamophobic law would, however, work, right? Like, um, you you first need to have a definition, you need to call out a definition. Um, and um, I mean, if the grand norm itself is not really operating properly, I am very unsure of how, uh, socio-politically speaking, in this environment, it's going to work, actually. Which is why I also stated that, you know, uh, the best way, at least in terms of advocacy efforts, would be to state a particular act as an act of torture. Because then, you know, it, it, it attracts that level of international condemnation, it prompts the international community to act. So, uh, uh, you know, several of these universal jurisdiction or 
um, proceedings uh, against the state for certain unlawful acts taking place, all of this consequently follows. Uh, there is Anvish who is having a question. Um, An Anvish, can you can you ask the yes, question? Can I go ahead? Yeah, sure. Yeah, my question is here to Ms. Ish Ishita because she is an expert on uh, law matters. Uh, so, uh, the uh, uh, I think there's a cross talk. Carry on, carry on, Anvish. Yeah. So my question uh, here is uh, primarily we have seen protests across the country in the universities and campuses, which are mostly restricted to government universities and campuses. Now, uh, the reason because I come from a uh, private university and there was a proper organization for during the anti-CA protests, but this was quashed very easily uh, because uh, the method was uh, deploying security guards. However, most uh, mm -hmm. private colleges come with this uh, affidavit that we need to sign before we get admission. It tells uh, that we are not uh, legally, we do not have any right once we sign this uh, affidavit to take part in any sort of social, uh, social economic or even anti-administration protests even against any kind of administration, be it college, state, or uh, country. So now, what are the legal aspects of this? And is it even legal to make uh, students who go into private university sign these kind of uh, affidavits which uh, restrict their uh, freedom of expression? Um, hi, Amish. So legally speaking, the Supreme Court has actually held in a number of cases. OK, I'm really sorry because I haven't switched on the video. I think there's some kind of problem with the network. Um, yeah, so um, coming back to your question, um, the Supreme Court has in several instances also held that, you know, your because of this balancing act of right to peaceful assembly and uh, expression and so on versus the society, uh, society's interests. In several cases, it has held that you do have the right to protest, but then it can be circumscribed in cases where let's say uh, you're protesting on a property which is owned by somebody else, right? Which basically means that these private properties, um, if, if you wish to undertake any form of protest over there, that could actually be termed as illegal. Um, this is at least what the current jurisprudence is with respect to protest in India. So that uh, so even private university. It does, it does, because, uh, you know, it, it, what it states is this, that any premises which uh, is privately owned or whose ownership possession lies with somebody else, with a private party, you cannot protest over there. Uh, thank you very much. I think, yeah, that would be. Okay, uh, next is Mutayab. Uh, Mutayab is here. Uh, Asalaamu Alaikum. Uh I'm sorry, I unmuted myself first. Uh, I have a question for Tazeen. Uh, and my question is, uh, in your initial remarks, you talked about the leftists and the liberals. I'd like, to, you, I'd like you to elaborate on the point of liberals. When we say liberals, what social group are we exactly talking about? In this context, how do you see a situation wherein the people who might not actually associate themselves as liberals are actually influenced by liberal values? and impose them on people holding Islamic values or values we get from revelation. An issue around uh, is being in solidarity with the queer movement that, had, that has been a topic of hot debate recently. Yeah, sure. Uh, so what do I mean by liberals? Obviously, uh, liberals themselves is also a very, you know, it's a, it's a very uncategorized uh, identity and uh, a lot of uh, people who are, you know, who just believe in the idea of expression, in the idea of, you know, the idea of uh, uh, the um, freedom to express, and they believe that in the idea of dissent, and they believe, you know, that uh, the, the state should be questioned. Um, uh, and they do not have a particular ideology they believe in. They situate themselves in the liberal circle. Uh, that's how it happens in India, especially if they are not, you know, very well read 
about the ideology. So that is what I meant by when I said uh, liberals and uh, liberals. Yeah, so that's what I meant by liberals. And I am so sorry, I didn't actually understand your second question, which was about the key. Can you actually type it or can you repeat it again so I can understand it? Uh, yes, sure. I'll send you uh, it in the written form. Yeah, yeah, please do that. Until then, I would like to just add to what Ishita said about anti-Islamophobic law. I think, uh, I believe that uh, we do need to have something like that because if, if, if we do not have an anti-Islamophobic law, then, you know, all of the things which are happening, like, you know, the lynch things which are happening or the love jihad and everything is happening, just get grouped into, uh, and uh, Islamophobia does not get to government and we do need to have that. I'm just reading the question. Give me a minute. Yeah, so uh, actually we also need to understand what do we mean by when we say that, you know, that people who are holding Islam, Islamic values, how uh, we also need to understand what their political location as Muslims is in India. And uh, about the liberals who, you know, who are not actually liberals, but they are only influenced by liberal values and they impose themselves on people uh, who hold Islamic values. This has been happening a lot especially because there are a lot of Muslims who are also, uh, you know, they are influenced by liberal values and they are also trying to impose it on people who are holding Islamic values. So that is actually a very problematic area because, uh, again, you know, we need to understand about our orientation, why we are asserting our identity as Muslims. And, you know, and, and you know, th th that is the point. That is the point. We have to understand why we are asserting our identity so we can actually, you know, present a counter argument to them. Uh, yeah. But, uh, is there any other questions or otherwise we'll uh, try to wind it up. It has been like uh, one and a half hours almost. Almost one hour, sorry. Hi, uh, Irfan. So uh, this wasn't really a question. It's just follow up to what uh, Tazeen has said um, sure, sure. with reference to uh, the anti-Islamophobic law. I do agree that there should be such laws in place. What, um, however, I am skeptical about is how it's actually going to be brought about. Because in the current political environment, I'm not really sure what is um, you know, how it's going to be, how it's ever going to see the light of the day. So I think, yeah, I mean, I'm just skeptical about it being brought about in the first place and how it's going to be framed. What do you actually term as Islamophobic? Um, in, you know, this is uh, a matter of academic deliberation as well. It has been for quite some time. What activities, what acts um, do you see as Islamophobic? And uh, you simply restrict it to maybe state missionary, state officials, or do you also include private persons into it, and so on and so forth. So it's not really a question on whether um, the act should be brought in place or not, but what could be the scope of the act? Yeah, I want to add on. Uh, I yeah, I totally agree with Vishita here. They, uh, we do need an anti-Islamophobic law, but obviously it, it, I don't think it's a possibility right now, especially, you know, as the situation that we are, we have been seeing in Indian state for quite some time. And yes, the Islamophobia itself is, is a matter of academic education. Totally agree. Sure. I I, uh, I believe that there is uh, no more questions which are like stuck in the throat kind of a situation right now. And if uh, anything is up, then um, we can raise the questions afterwards also. We have uh, uh, contacts of uh, dear Ishita and Tazim. So if anything comes up, then uh, you, you can directly contact 
uh, fraternity movement or uh, if it happens then we can direct you towards the speakers thank you uh Ishita. you have taken your uh, lot of research have been done and um, which has been presented here and we are very grateful that um, this platform has been um, used uh, for such a presentation and the, the, the huge chunk of group who have uh, reached here they are very happy and they have a lot many questions running around so uh, very much um, happy and thank you Ishita for this uh, wonderful lecture for coming here and um, delivering the speech here and uh, yeah Tazeen, uh, yeah, we are much honored to have uh, you as our uh, speaker, one of our speakers. And um, it has been like, uh, I, as I expected, it was a mix of um, the experience of um, a, a, a experience which, which came in, in, in the time of um, the anti-CA protest and movement. And that gave us a, a bit of the, the feeling of uh, the struggle is still going on and uh, that that was something which was a very necessary uh, question or very, very necessary situation which we were looking into. And thank you, Tazeen, for uh, such a wonderful explanation. And you, uh, both of you, were very clear about your presentations, and I'm very much happy about the same. Um, I thank everybody who have uh, participated in the in the session, and. Um, yeah, actually, this is uh, going live in Facebook, and also we have uh, recorded the video. We'll be uploading it in the YouTube, and uh, the link will be produced in the Facebook itself. So thank you, everyone, once again uh, for being a part of this. And uh, for your information again, uh, we have uh, almost around uh, three more sessions or four more sessions coming up uh, in this month itself before 31st of uh, Jan. Uh, Professor Ziauddin, he is here right now uh, listening to our, um, our, our program. He is one of our uh, eminent speakers. Uh, he is uh, faculty at uh, Maulana Azad National Urdu University. And uh, again, uh, we have uh, Professor Irfan Ahmad, uh, uh, who is the professor of Gottingen. He is, he'll be joining us in, the, in one of our sessions. And uh, we have um, Professor uh, uh, Tanvir Fazal of uh, University of Hyderabad. Uh, he'll also be joining us in the coming sessions. And uh, Sharjil Usmani and, uh, of Aligarh Muslim University, uh, a research scholar from uh, Oxford, uh, who is uh, Abdullah Azam. He is ex-union uh, president of uh, Aligarh Muslim University. And uh, Sharjil, uh, Sharjil Usmani, is, uh, as I told you. And uh, we also have uh, Rania Zulekha, who is a student of Delhi University and has been a part of the anti CA movement. And also we have uh, Afrin Fatima, uh, who is again uh, another face of uh, the anti CA movement, who is a student of uh, JNU and this was called from JNU. Thank you everyone once again, and uh, I wind it up. Yeah, thank you.